Chris Stedman is here speaking at our Humanist MN September 2020 community gathering. Chris is the author of IRL, Finding Realness, Meaning and Belonging in Our Digital Lives. And that is the topic of today's talk. By the way, IRL stands for In Real Life. He is also author of Faithiest, how an atheist found common ground with the religious. Formerly the founding executive director of the Yale Humanist Community, Chris also served as humanist chaplain at Harvard University and is currently adjunct professor in the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Augsburg University. He has written for The Guardian, The Atlantic, Pitchfork, Buzzfeed, and Vice, and has appeared on CNN MSNBC, and PBS. Chris is a native Minnesotan who returned to the Twin Cities two years ago after being away for about a decade. We pick up his talk here just after he shared with us some of his reasons for coming home to Minnesota. He brings with him many lessons from his years of experience as a humanist chaplain and community organizer along with many questions about building community among the rapidly growing secular demographic that skews young and is more defined by our digital age than traditional civic and religious organizations. Here's Chris. And other uh, similar programs. Um, and, and really, you know, we, it was a kind of a center for people to find the kind of opportunities to connect to gather to reflect on their lives that people often find in religious spaces and so we started a conversation about what it would look like to establish something like that here and at the beginning of that process i found myself you know asking questions based on the sort of you know eight years or so that i had been working as a humanist community builder about what exactly non-religious people are looking for in community and in particular the kind of large swath of the population that identifies as non-religious. So when survey, um, when people who are conducting surveys ask people what their religious identity is, there's this large and, and quickly growing segment of the population that says that they don't identify with a religious tradition at all. Um, they're often referred to as the religiously unaffiliated or the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S is. Um, and you know, this is a population of people who say that they're not religious, but who, at least in my experience working as a humanist community builder, were sort of hard to identify and hard to reach. And I found myself wondering how much of that had to do with, you know, whether or not I really understood what their values were, what their priorities were, what they were looking for in community. So uh, fortunately, um, a couple of the sort of top researchers um, in the country studying the religiously unaffiliated were based at the U, the University of Minnesota. And so I started a, a years long process that the Humanists of Minnesota have been involved in working with these researchers um, to try to better understand what the religiously unaffiliated actually believe um, because the survey data that we have on the religiously unaffiliated um, doesn't go nearly as deep as would be sort of most helpful when thinking about what a Center for Humanist Life should offer this population, what their needs are, um, as well as what community even means to them, um, what they expect to get out of community, what they expect to contribute to community, where they're currently finding a sense of belonging in their lives, what kind of practices help shape their lives help give them opportunities to reflect and so these were all things that we wanted to understand better so um what i what i didn't realize at the time um, because i'm not a survey researcher so this was a big learning process for me um, is that this is a very long process <laughs> so um we this last this last year we were finally able to find the funding that we needed um, to actually run the survey and also we went through a long process of sort of developing the survey, testing the survey, making sure it was actually gonna find the information that we were trying to find and so on. And so we have found some, um, some interesting things. We're in the process of, you know, I'm working with a couple of researchers. One of them is now at UMass Boston. So he moved partway into this process. And so, we're, you know, I'm working with a couple of very busy researchers. Um, 
but we're in the process of finalizing a report that we're going to share with the Humanist Minnesota as well as other groups um, that are trying to serve the religiously unaffiliated and support them um, with some of our findings. But one of the things that started to emerge in this research that also kind of aligned with a, a suspicion that I've had um, for years is that more and more of these people who are leaving institutions are moving the work that has historically happened in these religious institutions or in other civic institutions, the work of finding a sense of belonging, of making sense of their lives and connecting with other people. They're moving that work to the internet. Um, and, they're, and, and so what once happened in a sort of more communal way is, is now happening in a sort of more individual way. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of challenges and, and pluses about that. Um, which the book gets into. But at the beginning of the process, I really wasn't sure what, what I thought about it. Um, so when there, for years now, people who sort of look at the culture of the internet have kind of um, lumped into these broad categories, the, the kind of orientations that critics, um, not necessarily um, people who are against the internet, but people who sort of take a critical position to the internet, they've sort of put them into these two broad categories. Those who are, are sort of have a utopian um, kind of view of the internet. So who think the internet is making us um, more connected, um, more um, sort of efficient, um, helping us cross boundaries that we could have never crossed before, you know, who take this very sort of positive view of the internet. And then there are the, um, the, the folks who have a, what we might call the apocalyptics, um, who take a, a much more negative stance on the internet, um, who think it is making us more selfish, more disconnected, more anxious, more lonely. Um, and there's uh, you know, all kinds of sort of um, emerging studies that have come out that, that kind of suggest this. And so when I was first starting this, this search, um, I, to, to try and better understand sort of if, if more of the work that has historically happened in religious institutions is now moving to the internet, well, how is that impacting the way that we understand what it means to be human? How is it impacting our understanding of what it means to be a part of a community, to reflect on our lives, what practices we use to kind of make sense of the world around us? Um, and and so when I first started this search, I was I would say I definitely leaned more in the apocalyptic direction, um, because uh, not only did this search kind of coincide with this move back to Minnesota and this work um, to try and better understand the nuns, but it also coincided with a time in my life when I was going through a lot of personal sort of changes. Um, I had just gotten out of a long term relationship that had kind of been a defining relationship for me. We had lived together. We adopted a dog together. Um, I. Uh, it was sort of ending my career as a, a humanist chaplain, at least that sort of chapter of my career um, at Harvard and Yale. And I moved back to Minnesota where I had grown up. Um, and, you know, I'd lived sort of far away from my family for about a decade and had this more independent life. And so I was going through these large life changes and I, I started to notice that my social media output um, really wasn't reflecting the kind of personal experience I was having. So I kind of continued to post online as if it was business as usual, um, as if sort of all was well, even though I was actually sort of struggling uh, considerably as I was going through these shifts. And so when I noticed that, when I noticed that I was kind of feeling this split between the full person that I am and what I was sharing online and what I wasn't, um, I think I had a little bit more of a cynical view um, as a result. But this search um, took me in some really unexpected directions. So. I think by the end of the process, rather than feeling like I was a, a sort of utopian or uh, an apocalyptic when it comes to how the internet affects the way that we understand who we are, I ended up somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, I, in the sense that I think that the internet presents very real challenges that we have to wrestle with new challenges as well as sort of new iterations of age old challenges. Um, and I also think it presents new opportunities, opportunities to make connections in ways we never could have before, all of which I explore sort of more deeply in the book. But I, I also think, uh, and, I, and, you know, and I think we have a responsibility to kind of try to be honest with ourselves about those challenges and those opportunities in order to, to make life online better, um, to make it more possible to show up more fully human. 
But I also started to feel something else, which is that the internet presents this new opportunity for us to reapproach and and reimagine, reconsider these kind of age old questions about what it means to be human, what it means to belong. Um, and and there's there's a couple of reasons for this. So at the beginning of this search, um, I started, I, I tried looking in, uh, I mean, so I did a ton of interviews. I interviewed people about their digital lives. I, I read a lot of books about the internet um, by people sort of all across the spectrum from a more negative view of the internet to a more positive view of the internet. But I also wanted to try and look in some unexpected places. And so I, I really began the search in earnest at the um, the map library at the University of Minnesota, which might not make a whole lot of sense, but I'll I'll say a little bit more about why I I kind of started there. So I've always I've always been super interested in maps. When I was a kid, I said I wanted to be a cartographer. Um, I placed decently well um, in the Minnesota Geography B as a kid. Um, it's a fraught subject still to this day, um, and uh and i've always loved i've always loved maps and um but it wasn't just a personal interest i also found myself sort of thinking a lot about cartography and about the process that map makers enter into when creating a map so they have to take stock of this complex vast three-dimensional terrain and turn it into something two-dimensional that people can use to understand what that space is. So this is a process of representation, um, but it's, it's also a process of kind of selection and reduction. So you can't put everything on the map. Um, the representation cannot include every detail of the space itself or else the map would be the size of the territory itself, right? You have to choose what you're going to show and what you're not going to show. And um, I started to feel like that was a similar process that we kind of enter into when sharing our lives and connecting with others online. We have to sort of choose what we're showing and what we're not showing. And of course, this isn't a new phenomenon. We've always sort of done this. The, the um, you know, a lot of families uh, have sent out letters at the end of the year sort of to, to loved ones and friends talking about um, what happened over the course of the year. And of course, they're going to mostly talk about the good things and, and, and maybe leave the more complicated things out. Um, but it also, this this process also reveals that, um, you know, we're not just sort of individuals making random choices, we're making choices based on um, the, the sort of norms and conventions of the platform, of the, the sort of tool that we're using. So cartographers don't just create these sort of neutral representations of space, their representations reflect the interests of power um, of, you know, I, I interviewed the, the head of the map library when I first started and he talked about how he shows students um, a map of Germany from a certain point in history and um, explains to them that this this map doesn't, you know, represent Germany exactly as it was at that point in time. It represents the, the king's view of Germany because the king was the one who commissioned the map. And, and so we look at maps, I think, as these kind of neutral representations of a space but really they, they reflect all kinds of conventions and norms um, that have emerged within the field of cartography based on various interests. And of course, the same is true of the, the ways that we sort of show up in digital space. Um, I, you know, we think that we have left, um, and I'll use the we at least to speak for myself here as someone who has spent a great deal of my life online and who spends to this day still much of my life online. Um, we think we're sort of leaving these old institutions that have various norms um, and conventions that we find challenging, like a, a religious institution, and moving that work to a more individualized sort of online experience. But really, we're sort of swapping out one institution for another. And until we're honest with ourselves about what the norms and conventions of our digital institutions are, um, we can't really have an experience of the internet that allows us to feel um, like we're sort of showing up in a more real way there. Um, and that certainly was kind of the point I reached during this time in my life when I was struggling with why, why do I feel like certain things that I share, you know, there's certain things are okay for me to share online and others aren't. But it's not all, it's not all bad news. Um, one of the things that I came to, to recognize during this time was that um, what makes being human online so challenging is also 
part of what makes it this sort of new opportunity to reapproach these age-old questions of what it means to be human in a new way. Because the internet has essentially turned us into amateurs. Um, it is a, a new way of being human. And as such, um, you know, we're not good at it yet. We're still trying to figure out how to use it well. Um, I, in the book, I talk sort of early on in the book, I talk about an experience of going to an amateur drag show in Minneapolis. Um, so that's the night when people who are just beginning um, to sort of dip their toes into the water of, of drag performing, um, for that, that's the night that they perform. And so I remember watching these performances and, and feeling like the performances were really all over the map. Um, some were um, really sort of hesitant and, and um, afraid to take risks. Others were taking huge risks that really didn't work. But very few of them were, were sort of thinking about, um, were, were doing a performance that was sort of refined to um, reward what the audience was looking looking for. They were all sort of trying new things, taking chances, trying things that didn't work and learning from that kind of trial and error. And I had a, a similar experience um, when I was in high school and my mom told me I had to go out for a sport, um, which I was not uh, not at all enthused about. I was a, a kind of a bookish kid. Um, again, geography was like my favorite thing as a kid. So um, my siblings were all very athletic and um, I really resented this idea that I had to go out for a sport because that was kind of their thing. And, and prior to that, I kind of stuck to the things that I was sort of naturally drawn to, that I was already good at, that I was passionate about. But she um, really wanted me to step outside my comfort zone. So I tried out for the cross country team, thinking I'm so terrible at running, especially running long distances. There's no way I'll make the team. Of course, um, that strategy totally backfired because what I didn't realize, um, given my complete lack of awareness of anything to do with athletics, is that everyone makes the team in cross country, no matter how bad you are. So um, I unfortunately made the team and, um, and sure enough, I was horrible. I was probably the, in last place um, in the beginning, pretty much every time. But something um, unexpected happened over the course of the season, which was that as it went on, I got better and better. Um, and I actually ended up getting, for my first two years in a row, I got uh, the most improved award. Although, uh, don't be too impressed. That um, just represents how bad I was when I started. But I think the thing that was actually more surprising was that I surprised myself, not by improving at something that I was naturally not good at, but actually I discovered that I liked it. This thing that I had kind of told myself was not my thing that I would not like at all. And I, I still run to this day. I find it to be, um, for me, a very helpful practice, um, both it, you know, in terms of staying healthy and um, being active, but also um, it helps me um, reflect on my life and, and it gives me an opportunity to kind of carve out space for um, you know, spending time um, just uh, sort of having this other kind of experience. And so, um, I, yeah, I ended up finding out that there were, I learned things about myself by doing something I was not good at yet um, because I had to kind of try something in a new way. And I think that life online is like that a lot, at least for me. Um, you know, we're all trying to figure out collectively how to be in this new space together. Um, I think many of us have felt that this year uh, very acutely. But in that trial and error, in having to kind of go back to the drawing board and, and look and really look at, you know, and ask ourselves, what am, what do I most need out of this in order to feel a genuine sense of connection? Um, I think that there's real value in that. I think in these sort of inelegant attempts to be human online, we have an opportunity to, to see ourselves more fully. Um, and so that's what the, the book attempts to do. It attempts to give readers opportunities to you have to forgive me if you heard that noise outside something fell outside um it gives readers it hopes it aspires to give readers an opportunity to not only learn from um the many different people who i interviewed um yeah i again i tried to look in really unexpected places i interviewed game developers um uh, in order to try and understand how in in play we sort of have opportunities to experiment with our identities to express different parts of ourselves and how 
um, the internet often functions similarly, the kind of playful ways that we, you know, test out different pieces of our identity online. Um, I uh, went to a D and D meetup for the first time as a part of that as well. Uh, and so, you know, both by sort of interviewing people about their digital lives and, and engaging with, you know, people who have spent a lot of time thinking about these things, as well as looking maybe to some unexpected sources, I try to present an opportunity for us to think about, um, you know, what, what being online does to sort of how we understand ourselves. Um, and, you know, I, I would love to say that I came out on the other end of this process of writing this book with a sort of, you know, clear sense of this is, you know, the internet is good or the internet is bad, or this is, you know, this is how the, how the internet has changed what it means to be human. But I think we're really just sort of beginning that process. Um, I think that the internet shows us things about ourselves. People often refer to the internet as a kind of funhouse mirror in the sense that it warps some things and distorts the certain things, but also reveals others. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that that's true. I think that the internet shows us more and more of these sort of inherent contradictions in being human. But I think only by being honest with ourselves can we sort of begin that long process of using the internet. If, if we are able to use the internet to sort of become more fully ourselves, that's, that's work that's gonna have to be done intentionally. Um, and so I think, you know, the place that I landed is that regardless of whether or not you think of life online as being as real um, as life elsewhere, um, you know, I, I don't think that's a debate that we're gonna resolve anytime soon. Um, but I think that we do ourselves, we would do ourselves a favor by treating it sort of as if it is real, um, regardless of what we think about it, to sort of do our best to bring the, the values that we aspire to live in all parts of our lives into digital space. Um, I, I kind of borrow that phrase from a, a Lutheran theologian, actually, um, who some of you might be familiar with, named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit biased in that direction, though I'm an atheist and a humanist. Um, I, I um, now teach, as, as was mentioned earlier, at a Lutheran University here in town, or Lutheran-affiliated at least, university um, called Augsburg University. And my, um, it, that's also where I went when I was an undergraduate student studying religion um, back in the day. And my advisor there was a, a Bonhoeffer scholar, which, so that was when I first learned about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, he was living in Germany at the time of the, the rise of, of the Nazis. Um, and uh, he actually, um, you know, he sort of went through this process of, 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 of struggling with, you know, what his response to this, the context that he was in should be. And he ended up um, just, you know, his, one of his sort of strongest beliefs was that Christians shouldn't expect uh, sort of God to intervene in the world on on um, you know on their behalf, um, they shouldn't expect God to step in and solve uh, problems in the world. Instead, Christians um, have a responsibility to to act um, on God's behalf in the world um, for for peace, for justice. And so, he you know for him he took that all the way to um, um, you know he felt that really acting as God's agent in the world required that he participate in a conspiracy to assassinate Hitler, which ultimately, um, you know, he was caught for and, and put in prison. And, um, and you know, it ended up um, being the, the cause of his death. And so, um, obviously, I'm not, a, I'm not a believer in God, but I do think that this idea that um, even when we're not sure you know what exactly we should be doing that we should sort of still try to live kind of as if um as if we should we should take seriously our commitments our values um, and follow those as best we can i think you know the internet is such a we're, we're living in a time of swirl and change as we kind of transition from a pre-digital society to a digital one and in swirl and change there is loss there is gain um, you know, there are immense uh, wrongs that need to be corrected. And we see this all over our digital lives. And, and one of the things that I really, you know, talk about at the end of the book is that I think that we, we will not be able to use the, hum the internet to be more fully human um, as long as the platforms that we use um, to try to be human online are sort of motivated first and foremost by profit. So we're, you know, we're operating on platforms that are driven by profit above all else. 
they don't care if we're having an experience online that connects us more deeply to other people or that helps us reflect more honestly on our lives. Um, they just care that we're, we're continuing to click and scroll. Um, and sure enough, there was an eight year longitudinal study that came out of BYU um, that found that, um, you know, and this sort of dispels the idea um, that has been, I think, a common talking point for a long time, which is that, you know, more time online makes you lonelier, more unhappy. Um, they actually found, BYU found, that two people could spend the same exact amount of time online um, and have wildly different experiences of it, and that it came down to whether or not they were sort of being intentional and purposeful about how they were using it, or if they were sort of just mindlessly clicking and and being driven by you know the the algorithms um, uh, to to sort of keep clicking on the next thing. And I think we, many of us have had these very different kinds of experiences online before. I know I have. I know last night as I was reading through all of the different responses to Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, I was having more of the, the second kind of experience. I was not, or the first kind of experience, I was not being very mindful. I was um, sort of ex anxiety or doom scrolling, as people call it. Um, and so, I, you know, I think in this swirl of, of change, of loss, um, of gain, we have to have hard and serious conversations about how these platforms drive us in certain directions for very particular ends. This kind of comes back to the norms and conventions piece from cartography. But I also think that our fate isn't yet set. Um, I think that we, that only by sort of intentionally asking these questions about what it means to be human, will we be able to sort of harness the the promise of this moment the the kind of what we have to gain by being amateurs um, because some of our greatest learning or at least some of mine happens when things sort of change when things overlap and intersect the last few years of my life when you know a lot was changing in my life were also one of the times when i sort of learned the most about myself and we're in this transitional moment this this sort of switch from the pre-digital to the digital um, and transition is painful. It's hard. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I spent a lot of time over the last few years working on this book, um, taking care of my, my stepdad with, who has Alzheimer's and sort of watching him go through a transition and our relationship go through a transition as well. And I think there are a lot of people who would look at my stepdad now and say, well, he's less real um, of a person than he was. Uh, he's not himself in the same way. Um, and it's true. He's not himself in in the same way but that doesn't mean that he's in that transition that it's been all sort of loss there's we also developed a kind of relationship that we never had before um, because he had to rely on me a bit more um, whereas you know for most of our relationship it had kind of gone the other way he had he taught me how to drive he um, you know was very much a, a kind of a, a parental figure to me in many of the the classic ways and and we actually have grown very close as a result of this. Um, and it's it's caused both of us to have to sort of go back to the drawing board a little bit, both in our relationship and in our understanding of what it means to be us. Um, but I think it, it's like they, the longitudinal study at BYU found, you have to be willing to, or you have to be um, being sort of intentional and purposeful about what you're doing. And right now that's very difficult. The odds are stacked against us by, you know, on these platforms that are driven first and foremost by profit. But that doesn't mean that we don't have some agency, um, some power um, to harness the, the opportunities of this moment. And so um, then my hope is that the book will help offer some opportunities to reflect on that a little bit more. Um, certainly it's the result of, of my spending years, um, years reflecting on it, uh, even when I didn't always want to. So I think I'll leave it at that, um, knowing that uh, we've got some time for conversation and that I think that in my experience, that's when um, the things that are really on your mind sort of come out. Um, I don't want to assume I've already addressed them. So I, I'm definitely eager to hear your, your questions, your thoughts. Um, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit more about the project I've been working on these last few years. So thank you. So I think Harlan now yes, is going to Yes, I need to unmute in. Harlan. If I can find you, Harlan. <laughs> I think you can unmute yourself. I'm looking for Harlan also. There, there you I'm are. I'm right Harlan. here. I think yeah. I was talking, okay, I was talking to everyone and nobody was there. Anyway, <laughs> thanks so much.
Thanks so much, Chris, for your presentation. I really enjoyed it, as always. You've been such a great friend. You've been such a great friend to our community, and you're always welcome to come back if you have a new book or if you just have some time and you want to talk to us some more. That'd be great. Okay, we're going to have a question and answer period now. And the way we're going to do it, it's be about a half an hour or so. Depends on uh, the amount of activity we have. And uh, most of you who are familiar with Zoom will know that depending on the type of computer or iP iPad, tablet you have, there's a participant um, uh, icon at the either top or the bottom of your of your computer or your tablet. And if you if you tap on that, uh, you'll see that there's different things you can do. And one of them is raising your hand. Okay, see that hand icon? So please, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I will recognize you and you can ask Chris your question. And again, please keep your questions succinct and short or your comments succinct, succinct and short so that most people who want to ask a question will have an opportunity to do so. And I will intervene if it is too long or the question is sort of meandering, I will intervene. So I want to give you a fair warning up front. So, um, oh, by the way, are, do people understand that if you want to be in the drawing for Chris's book, you'll need to communicate with Nick that you're interested in, the, in being part of the drawing. So please take advantage of that. Um, so I, I'm looking for questions. I think, uh, did uh, Christine have a question? She did not. Okay. Well, I'm, how many, uh, I want to ask you, Chris, how many, how many um, social media platforms do you um, go to every day or that you're part of? And which ones? Oh, are gosh. They? Yeah, so uh, I'm anyone who knows me at all, or, or knows me at least, you know, decently well knows that Twitter is the, the one that I'm on the most. Um, I've met many friends over the years who are not Twitter users when I meet them and they, you know, they sort of learn that I'm, I'm quite active on Twitter and, um, and ask if they should sign up for it. And the thing I always say to people is that Twitter really only exists for the most obsessed. Um, it is not, there's not really much any value in being a, a casual Twitter user um, because it's, it's a sort of constant stream of conversation. It's less a place that you can sort of casually check in. Um, so Twitter has kind of hooked me for better or for worse. Um, I, uh, I do use Instagram some. Uh, I, am, I technically still have a Facebook, but I, I really don't use it much. I, it really actually, ever since I think 2011 or 2012, I, um, I became much less active on Facebook. I still use it um, in part because there are some people who, um, uh, you know, who that's kind of their primary way of, of staying connected. Um, but, and then, um, you know, I, I think I have a threshold for just how many I, I can really use at any one moment. So um, I've kind of come and gone with a few others. Um, a, a number of people I know really enjoy TikToks. Um, I consume them. I view TikToks, but I just don't think I have the the creativity that it requires, or the specific kind of creativity that creating TikToks require. But um, yeah, I'm I'm quite active on on Twitter. That's really the the sort of biggest one. I I can't uh, raise my hand because I'm one of the hosts with the with the uh, manual. Uh, so I'm going to just jump in here. Um, Chris, could you say a little bit more about how we experiment or what are some maybe maybe some do's and don'ts of um, um part of it is many people are have been criticized and one of is that we we project these very false impressions of ourselves online and so how do you and sometimes we do in person too you know it's not like um we all show up in the world and and hang out our dirty laundry for everyone to see. But um, what, are, what are some ways to say, how to start to be a little more real? I think actually the last six months being on Zoom, some of us have been trying to be yeah. more real, but do you have some uh, kind of pointers or especially any pitfalls that we might avoid? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, I think, 
you know, I, I mentioned in the, the talk portion, this, you know, this idea that one of the things that the internet reveals to us about ourselves, I think, is that, you know, we're sort of inherently contradictory. And, and that's always been true. Um, it's, but I think part of what makes, what, what makes that more notable now and, and more difficult to navigate is that you know, we've always had these sort of various um, self-expressions that aren't false, but are sort of different depending on where we are. You know, I have the self that I am at work. I have the self that I am when I'm making a public presentation. I have the self I am with my boyfriend. I have the self I am with my family. And these are all sort of different parts of this composite that makes up who I am. The challenge of the internet is that we have to kind of be one coherent self for all of these possible audiences. The person that you are online needs to be, you know, someone who can be viewed by a future employer, uh, you know, your old friend from high school, your parents, um, you know, it, that you, um, and so I think as we're trying to walk that tightrope, we start to recognize that, you know, actually, these different pieces of who we are sometimes come up against each other and contradict each other. And that that isn't some indication that who we are is false, um, but rather that's kind of always been part of what it means to be human is to struggle with that. And so um, there's a, a, one chapter of the book that really kind of dives into this a little bit, this kind of tension that people feel between um, the kind of self that they present online, um, the self that they are um, you know, in, in sort of other parts of their lives, the sense that everything online feels um, permanent, that you know, any sort of experimentation you try to do online is also kind of documented. Um, and, and yet this feeling also that everything online is sort of ephemeral, that you can, you know, that you tweet something and, and suddenly it's gone down the timeline. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the places that I started when I was trying to sort of explore this a little bit more, um, was looking, I, I interviewed people who sort of have use anonymous accounts to experiment with their identities, um, you know, and which is something that I, you know, I, so I grew up in this sort of in-between generation um, where I didn't have the internet in my house growing up. I, um, you know, by middle school, I could bike to the library to log on to the, one of the public computers there and use it for a 20 minute window or something before I had to give it up to somebody else. Um, and so it really wasn't a part of my, earliest formative years, but by the time I was starting to recognize that I was gay and and really sort of wrestle with that, I could bike to the library and, and sort of crouch in front of the computer and make sure no one was looking and type the word gay into the internet and, and discover that there were other people um, out there like me. And, and in fact, the first people I ever came out to were online in sort of an anonymous, through an anonymous account. And that was part of what helped me kind of get more comfortable with the idea of doing that. Um, I was able to sort of experiment with what it would be like to do that. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I also, you know, for the book, I interviewed a ton of people who, you know, still use anonymous accounts to this, to this day, you know, maybe they have a, a professional kind of job um, uh, that requires them to uh, present themselves publicly in a certain way, but they also have a, a sort of, secret Twitter account where they can just sort of post their, um, their frustrations or their, you know, their, their jokes that their coworkers might not get or something like that. Um, and, and I interviewed um, one person who um, is transgender who would use sort of online video games to experiment with her identity and to express herself in a, in a way that felt unsafe in other parts of her lives. And so you know, I mean, this is less of a book that has sort of, um, yeah, I think there's real value in, uh, you know, books that sort of say these are the kind of concrete things to do or the, the 10 steps to X, Y, or Z. This is less of that kind of book. And so, uh, you know, I, I think I have less um, of those kinds of concrete things to offer. But I, I think you, harnessing the internet's ability to give us chances to um, connect with people across boundaries that maybe we would have had a harder time before, like if you're in the closet, um, for example, um, as well as opportunities to kind of experiment with identity, play with identity. Um, I found real value in that. And it seems from what I've, I've learned from talking with others that um, others do too. But I also think that until we all get a little bit more comfortable with the fact that, um, you know, we, we all have, as, as to use your term, dirty laundry, um, we all, you know, have um, things that we would rather not share with every person in our lives. 
Um, and, and that, that, you know, I think, I think the internet will require us to get more comfortable with that. And I think that helps us feel, or at least it, it's helped me feel more fully human. Um, so I think those are, I don't want to go on too long. So I want to leave time for, I see we have many hands up, but those are a couple of things I found helpful. Okay. Thank you, Chris. We do have a queue of people who want to ask questions and we're going to do this in this order. Joseph, Donna, Alan, Jerry, Dave, Eduardo, Mark, and Asma. So let's start off with Joseph, and then when you're finished, I'll next I'll then call um, Donna. Joseph? Yeah, I was just wondering on what you think about the effects of the internet on like deep learning and um, reading. And I mean, I've seen mm -hmm. very clear examples of this in my life as a machine student, machining student of a, a guy on his smartphone the whole time when he should be machining these parts and it's just um it's just a it's it's absolutely a dilemma that you have to solve you should be machining the parts in lab and um i uh yeah and in concentration i've just seen since the internet has emerged the length of articles online and newspapers or whatever it may be has just gradually declined and just for people to sit down read an article and absorb it and understand it is a lot more difficult so i was just curious on your thoughts on that yeah it's a great question um it's a great question to ask someone who's publishing a book uh, in a time when people are reading shorter and shorter things and not only that uh, you know, this book is a lot longer and ended up being a lot longer than i planned than the publisher planned um and um and so yeah i mean i've, I've had to ask myself that question sometimes like why am i writing a book in a time when um that's and and yeah i remember i was a columnist for years um for this this online platform and they were always trying to to they were encouraging me to write shorter and shorter pieces um for that exact reason and i felt it in myself um i went on a, a three-month social media sabbatical last year while finishing the book um and i i found you know that even in a short amount of time of, of sort of spending a lot you know not spending all this time on twitter and stuff that my ability to focus on longer form things was you know increased um and there's you know as you say all kinds of um sort of research out there about this as well i think that again it it, it you know goes back to what i was saying uh, sort of near the end of my remarks there um the internet that all this the change that the internet has brought um, presents some real opportunities, obviously, um, in terms of, you know, and this is what the sort of utopians, um, the internet utopians talk about when they talk about the efficiency that it can create for us. But it also presents real challenges that have to be dealt with. Um, you know, it is, it's not efficient when it comes to trying to read a, a long form thing and, and finding yourself having to really focus on, on, on getting to the end. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is, I think, yeah, I, I study, um, uh, I've studied religion. Um, that was my, both my degrees were in religious studies. And so, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about and, and, and learning about how sort of repetitive behavior changes us. Uh, that's, you know, the idea behind ritual, right? If you want to focus more of your attention on a certain thing, rituals kind of help you do that by having you do something over and over again. Um, and, you know the things that we the, the things that we repeatedly do i think we often think it's the big changes in our lives like moving across the country back to your home state of minnesota for example we think that those are the things that are going to really change who we are um, but it's actually the things that we do day in day out that um, that really shape us and so i think that looking at our social media habits um, is a great place to begin trying to better understand who we are and why we do the things we do because I think they they really shape who we are if if they're things that we do day in and day out and I think that attention span is one great example um, and deep learning of of how of, of the 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 challenges that it that presents to us so I, I know that there's a lot more questions so that's a, a brief answer but I'm, I'm going to try and keep them brief for now thank you thanks Donna yeah um my quick question is Chris, you had mentioned a research study, you know, that that demonstrated that like to taking two people and they sit down to the same experience and, and one person has kind of a real negative, you know, reaction, um, maybe and then but the other person has a more positive 
emotional kind of experience. And I'm wondering if you could flesh out, you know, kind of what's the difference there? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I like to think of it as the difference between kind of deep play and shallow play. So deep play is the kind of play where you're, um, you know, like, uh, and, and, and the deep play can look like a lot of things. It can look like the imagination games my siblings and I played as children where we were sort of building these imagined worlds and characters and that, you know, this, and this was a space for us to, you know, that gave us opportunities to reflect on who we were, to forge stronger connections with each other. Um, and then there's the kind of mindless play of, of slot machines, things that sort of keep you, you know, and, and, and our digital lives sometimes that kind of keep us clicking, trying, chasing after that the sort of, um, you know, the, the boost of engagement, the rush that we get from retweets or sharing something online that makes us upset or something like that. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I think when it comes to digital life online and being, you know, or dig digital life and being human online, I think that we can play, we can experiment, um, we can connect, we can reflect, we can express ourselves in ways that are sort of intentional, purposeful, um, that are connective, that help us connect more deeply to who we are, to, to other people, um, or in ways that kind of are, are like a, a slot machine, like the shallow play um, that, that keeps you sort of clicking and scrolling. And again, so much of this has to do with the norms of the platforms. Um, and and uh, it's like climate change, right? We can make all kinds of individual changes in our lives to try and address the climate crisis. But when you know the majority of um, pollution comes from you know a small group of giant corporations um, and and a, just a smaller much smaller sliver from individuals individual behavior isn't gonna isn't going to get us where we need to be and so you can change your own experience uh, on the internet um, by being more intentional being more purposeful and there's real value in that but we also need to have a transformation of culture um, and that happens on the systemic level so I do think, and I've found this myself, that being more mindful of what you're trying to experience online, what kind of play you're trying to, uh, you know, to use this idea of deep play or shallow play, I think that makes a big difference, but I think we also have to think about this systemically as well. Thank Thanks. You. Jerry. Jerry, there you go. No, you're still unmuted. Okay. Um, Chris, you, ask the question, what does it mean to be human? And I'm interested in that question, irrespective of the internet, I, I'm interested in the question in the general terms, what does it mean to be human? And I'm interested because it sounds really heavy. It sounds like, whoa, wow, what does it mean to be human? Which gets me to wondering, is this uh, what Daniel Dennett's daughter called a deepity? Something that sounds really heavy, but when you poke at it, well, it's not really heavy. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could kind of, as a philosopher, say, unpack that question and kind of explain what's, what's the issue here? What does it mean to be human? What are some alternative possible meanings of or answers to that question? Could you, yeah. could you elaborate on that so that I at least am convinced that, oh, yeah, there's a really significant kind of issue here? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and also a great use of deepity, one of my favorite terms. Um, so, you know. I think, uh, first of all, I want to be clear, I'm not a philosopher. I do teach in the religion, the Department of Religion and Philosophy, but I'm not trained as a philosopher, so I don't want to overstate my credentials here. Um, but I actually would go back to, um, I am, so I am teaching, this year I'm teaching Religion 200, which is um, uh, one of the two, so all students at Augsburg take a Religion 100 class and a 200 class, and 200 is on vocation and the search for meaning. And so all semester long, I'm working with students as they try to sort of make sense of these questions about sort of who am I, how should I show up in the world, what is my responsibility to the world? And, you know, these are the kind of central questions of what it means, you know, what, what it means to be human. And for me, I trace this back to when I was around 11 years old, and I read um, a, a sort of series of books um, that invited me to reflect on these kinds of questions. Um, and those were books like um, Alex Haley's Roots, Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl, John Hershey's Hiroshima. So these were books that, you know, detailed some of the greatest um, atrocities in the history of human civilization. And they, they posed th this question to me of, you know, what does it mean that 
people can be so inhumane to, to one another? And also, what is my responsibility living in a world where these things happen to, you know, to respond to, to what's around me? And so um, going back to what I was saying, in, I think in the, a, a response, maybe two questions ago, um, I think that and this so this is on my mind because we just um one of in the last section of uh, religion 200 we were exploring you know whether or not um so when we think about people who have this sort of big vocation in life um the, the people who get lifted up as kind of moral exemplars um people like bonhoeffer for example or martin luther king jr um, gandhi um, you know, these are people who have lived the, who have made sort of immense sacrifices. Um, and, and I think there, there, this conflation happens that in order to live a life of meaning, in order to have a real vocation, you need to do something really huge. Um, but I think that, you know, oftentimes what it means to be human is found most um, in our sort of day-to-day -day activities. Um, so rather than going off on this sort of meditation retreat um, for six months to you know contemplate the meaning of existence i can actually find a lot of what i'm looking for by sort of paying more attention to the life that i live in the sort of minutia um, and this was part of i got part of this from one of when someone asks sort of what's the book that most represents your worldview as a secular person um the book that i like think of it, um most immediately is martin Hagelin's this life um so he it came out actually it only came out a couple of years ago um, but it really it was one of those examples of coming across a book that articulates so much of what you believe and also gives you new ways of thinking about it and seeing it um, and he he basically makes the argument um in in this life he's a he teaches at Yale um, and he's a philosopher unlike me <laughs> um, he he makes the argument that in order for life to have any meaning at all it needs to end if life sort of went on forever um, so if you believe in an afterlife or something like that then um, there is no sort of horizon ag against which things matter so things only matter because to us because eventually they'll sort of end relationships experiences and so on and and then so he he, you know, he sort of argues that the only world view that can have a real coherent meaning is, is a, a secular one. Um, and then he, he sort of builds from there to say that, you know, if that's true, then the most precious resource we have in life is our time. Um, that, you know, that we need to have time in our lives. It's not just devoted to survival, um, but also to, to um, considering what gives our lives meaning, what fulfills us. Um, and then, so he he takes that argument one step further and argues for a democratic socialist worldview because he says, you know, in order for everybody to have that that time to reflect on their lives, to understand what gives their lives meaning, and to devote the time toward the things that really matter to them, um, you know, we need to sort of reorganize society to make it possible for everybody to have to have that time available to them. And so. To bring this back to the internet, even though I know we were said sort of take the internet out of it, um, if life online moves us in the direction of clicking and scrolling, of sort of taking our time away from us um, rather than giving us opportunities to sort of think more deeply about who we are and what matters to us and connect us more to others, then it will feel like it makes us less human. Um, and that certainly has been my experience in moments. But if we are able to redirect it in, in the direction of um, giving us new opportunities to think about who we are and to connect with others, then I think it, it can be a real asset in that search for, for a better understanding of what it means to be human today. So um, I realize I've gone a little bit longer than I intended to, but I, I hope that uh, that speaks at least to part of your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Gill, you're up. Hey, Chris, uh, I'm wondering if you had the opportunity to interview any online trolls or if you have any insight into why they do what they do and if you have an opinion on the, how large their contribution is to the overall negative, the overall negativity uh, of an internet experience. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's actually a great um, podcast that I, I recommend um, hosted by a guy named Dylan Marin. Um, 
It's called Conversations with People Who Hate Me. And each episode, someone sort of, uh, he sets up an interview or a conversation between someone and, and someone who has trolled them um, and try to sort of understand that a little bit better. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, I, I certainly have experienced my share of trolls. Um, I think anyone who has a, any sort of public presence does at some point or another, but um, uh, you know, and, and, and again, the internet gives people new ways of, of engaging in, and, and this is something I sort of get into the book, the, the anonymity that can be liberative for people can also, um, you know, enable people to engage in all kinds of harmful ways. Um, but, um, you know, again, this is not something that the internet created, right? Um, I, you know, I received anonymous notes when I was in high school from people um, that were, you know, kind of harassing, um, slipped into my locker. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the internet, this, that's not to sort of equate those two things, because I do think that the internet, this is a real, this is like one of the harder, more complicated challenges of the internet. Um, especially as we see a sort of generation of people who are sort of leaving traditional institutions where they've um, found belonging and, and sort of looking for that online and often finding it in places that encourage that kind of behavior. Um, and so, you know, we see the rise of, of um, you know, the alt-right online and um, uh, Gamergate, stuff like that. And so, um, you know, I think that there is, I think it's a real, it's a real problem that has to be addressed. Um, but I also, again, I think it reveals things that have kind of always been there. Um, we all have, uh, well, I guess, I don't want to speak for everyone. I have, you know, my sort of um, nastier impulses. Um, I, I can be cruel um, and short tempered. And sometimes the internet uh, allows me to see that. But I think we need to encourage people to use the internet in a way that is, again, more reflective, that holds them accountable to their, you know, what their values um, ought to be. And, and this sort of, um, for lack of a better term, wild west of the internet that we have right now, um, that, you know, is, it doesn't necessarily um, encourage that and often encourages the opposite, a, a sort of more unreflective, impulsive online experience. So uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Eduardo, you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for being here. Um, and for all the other questions that have come there, I'm starting to inform the, my own question. Um, it seems to me that there's a good case to be optimistic about the um, the future of the internet in terms of its impact on humanity. And if we even think about the state of technology that we're having today, uh, did you, does your analysis take into account that, for example, we're at the sort of low bandwidth state of the internet where we have more textual uh, connection, less communications, as opposed to more of what we're having now, this more face-to-face -face interactive communication where we can have more real-time human connection. Is that part of, of your analysis? And kind of the related part of that is how you kind of throw the profit motive under the bus in terms of saying that we can't have a positive future of the internet because driven by profit, but isn't profit really a reflection of the human values that are at play as people decide how to um, how to spend their money uh, and so forth? So if you're pessimistic about the profit motive, you must be also pessimistic about people's valuing of humanity on the internet. Am I reading that right? I th yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. I mean, or it, it's a it's a way of putting it. I um, I do think, as you say, that you know it it does reflect what we value. And right now, the companies that are um, that are sort of you know maintaining the social platforms that people use to connect value a certain kind of online experience, one in which people spend more time online, regardless of sort of what that time is like, whether or not it's a, a sort of positive experience or a negative experience. You look at the sort of most regularly, um, every 
uh, every week, I think, um, uh, the, I see, uh, you know, the sort of top posts shared on Facebook that week. And it's, it's always um, these sort of clickbait, clickbait um, you know, sort of um, fear mongering types of things. Those tend to be the most shared uh, because, you know, if, if we're, so people refer to this as um, sort of content agnostic, um, that the platforms are kind of content agnostic. So they don't, they're not, they don't care what is being shared. They just want things to be shared and people to be using. Um, and so if, if anger, if fear, um, you know, are easier ways of driving clicks, then that's what will end up rising to the top. Um, and so it does reveal, you know, what we value. Um, but that doesn't- Current values, correct? Sorry? That's current values? Exactly. But that doesn't mean that that can't be transformed. Um, but it, it, it's a, it requires sort of active work. Um, we, and, and I agree with you. I mean, this is, you know, one thing that I um, reflected on a lot when I was working on the book is, as you say, this is really just the, you know, we've just scratched the surface of where, you know, the internet's not going away, right? Um, you know, this, and, and sure enough, this year has shown, like, I, I think even once the, we're not actively living under a pandemic, so much of life has moved online that a lot of it, a lot of it will stay there. Um, now that the sort of, you know, infrastructure is in place and the norms are established, you know, I think more and more life will continue to move in that direction and the technology will continue to advance. And so the question is, do we want to live this, you know, increasingly large part of our lives in a, in a kind of unreflective way, in a way that, you know, where the, what rises to the top is our, our sort of, you know, basest instincts? Um, or do we want to, you know, use our ability to, to sort of, you know, chart another course in the direction of our higher values? And I think we can, um, but I think that, that that's a process that needs to be actively, actively engaged in. So, yeah, for yeah. sure. Given, given that we're hardwired to, uh, to seek out the negative information that's available. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark. Mark Tosin. Chris, um, you, sp you speak a lot about being more human online, but I would say that it isn't really possible for us to be more or less human. We simply are human. So two related questions. Aren't you trying to express your preference for some ideal of personal authentic expression online? And why is it preferable to be open and vulnerable on the internet, which can be a very dangerous place to do so? Yeah, both very great questions. So I think oftentimes when I use sort of be human, what I'm using it as a shorthand for is feel human. So what's gonna feel most, as you say, sort of authentic or human for me, isn't gonna be the same for everybody. Um, but I do think, um, and, and as you say, the internet can be a very you know, dangerous place. I do think that it requires some degree um, of, of um, yeah, our relationships require some degree of authenticity. Even if, as I was saying in response to Audrey's question, you know, we're never gonna reveal everything about who we are to every person in our lives. Um, you know, we are sort of a composite of various selves in various spaces. And that's true online. You know, the internet is another space in which we are sort of um, one sort of facet of ourselves. Um, but vulnerability is always a piece of any kind of connection, any kind of, you know, um, you, all relationships require some degree of disclosure. Um, they certainly don't require full disclosure. And in fact, I don't think um, we, we, we aren't always honest with ourselves. It's, you know, I think we, to be fully um, vulnerable with somebody else's is, is probably not possible. And even if it is, you know, not, not preferable, not ideal. Um, but I think that right now, um, the, the kind of curatorial work that goes on online, which is not, again, exclusive to the internet, has kind of always been a part of how we show up in the world. Um, I think it currently um, devalues dis, uh, certain kinds of disclosure and values other kinds. Um, and, and actually what's been fascinating to see is that over the last few years in particular, um, there's been a move in the direction of, of kind of um, 
valuing authenticity more. So uh, influencers, for example, people who have large online followings whose career is kind of about, um, you know, uh, being on social media and being visible are trying to move in, in what what they want to people to see as a more kind of authentic direction because authenticity has become culturally valuable um, in because people feel as if the internet is fake or um, that who we are online is, is somehow not real. Um, there's become this, this sort of desire for authenticity um, and, and it's become, you know, sort of valuable to project an image of authenticity. Um, and so when people learn that authenticity is something that has value um, in that way, then that's something that they're, you know, they're going to try to um, sort of project. And so, you know, it's, it is, and, and so near the end of the book, I interview a philosopher um, here in Minnesota, and I ask, you know, what, I ask, I asked her to talk more about what sort of being real even means um, and how we might sort of think about um, what that actually means in light of our digital lives. And, and it's kind of, as you say, um, we all make normative claims when we're talking about, you know, how, um, how we ought to show up in society in this, you know, in these communities that we all sort of participate in we're all making and operating out of normative ideas around what is um what is required of that what sort of degree of disclosure and so on and so we're making competing propositions some are going to say it requires x y or z some are going to say it requires other things this is a big part of what we were trying to study um, when surveying the religiously unaffiliated to learn more about what they what they how they see being in community and what that requires of them um and yeah i think i think i think I, my book makes a series of arguments um for what i think will help us feel more real online others might not agree with them but uh but i think the only way to get closer to understanding what that might be is to have that conversation so i hope to contribute to it um certainly i don't hope to nor expect to give the authoritative answer on it. Thanks. Thank you. Asma from Egypt, you have a question. Yes, uh, actually my question has changed many times between, uh, but uh, what I think now about being real, it is, uh, is that uh, it is more according to a degree of psychological and psychological and mental maturity for everyone. I think that I look for everyone as an exception and what they actually as uh, in their lives, we cannot s seem to con control what, what they are doing. Uh, the internet is is, is a great way for me, but it has disadvantages. And human who seek to be real will just seek real at, at every age. Even he, you, you say that uh, being real in the age of uh, Twitter and TikTok, I'm not really, just, I really understand what you mean by that, but. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I think I caught most of what you were saying, it was uh, having some connection issues um, at various points for me. I'm not sure if it was for others as well. But um, that last piece, especially the sort of, uh, you know, looking for realness at various points in our lives, not just in the age of sort of Twitter and TikTok. I think, you know, this is actually one thing that we found um, when surveying the nuns in, and, you know, this will, when we sort of share, um, uh, we've got a paper in the works, so this is. Um, I don't think I, I don't think I have to keep it secret, but it's it's not something that it's not a finding that we've shared yet. But we did find that you know, people often talk about um, this sort of digital dualism, this idea that um, the internet or life online is sort of less real than life offline, or our lives are kind of split between this sort of fuller, more online or more offline experience and this more limited online experience. And we found that even though people actually, um, our respondents mixed 
their sort of search for meaning and belonging between offline and on online, um, they often reported um, sort of, you know, if, if they were looking for meaning in community online, they were also more look more likely to look for meaning in community. Um, or if they were looking for meaning online, they were also more likely to look for community online. And likewise, if they were looking for meaning offline, they were more likely to also look for it um, offline as well. So there was there felt um, it's, there was a self-reported split, um, which actually surprised me because my sense would was that people who were sort of looking for meaning, who were interested in questions of meaning and purpose, would look online and offline, um, and you know, and that people who were looking for community and belonging would look online and offline. But it really, um, we found anyway that they self-reported um, a, a kind of split there. Um, but I think that we we have always from the the beginning of um, uh, you know s recorded civilization, we have always um, asked these questions about who we are, what our place in the world is, um, and it's all. But they take particular shape depending on the moment in time in which we're asking them, and so those questions those questions look different now than they did before. It doesn't mean that the questions themselves are fundamentally different. It, but it does mean that we're going about asking them and trying to sort of meet those needs in in new ways um, in in part because of the more digital um, lives that we lead and so it's worth reapproaching those questions and and looking at the ways that we're trying to meet them and what those reveal um, about who we are um, and and so it isn't that um, we can only ask these questions now because of the specific moment that we are living in or that the answers that we're going to have are going to be fundamentally different from the answers we would have had before. But the ways that we approach and understand them, this kind of goes back to something I was saying in the talk, um, in terms of how the internet makes us amateurs, it sort of gives us a chance to reapproach them. And in reapproaching something, we have a chance to, um, just like my colleagues in the um, religion and philosophy department at Augsburg, um, many of them are, have had to move their classes that have been offline online. And in doing so, they've had to kind of ask, go back to the drawing board a little bit and say, okay, what, rather than just being able to copy and paste what they did offline, they're having to say, okay, what are the actual goals of this class? Um, and how can I sort of reimagine them in this new space? Uh, and so I, I think that is what we have an opportunity to do as our lives move more online. Uh, thanks, uh, Chris. Now, Mary has a question, but before I turn it over to Mary, please, folks, if you want a copy of uh, Chris's book, please uh, chat, send a chat to Nick, uh, telling them, telling him that uh, you're interested in being part of the draw drawing. Mary, you have a question. Mm, yes, Chris, it's so nice to see you again. I and I, really appre I appreciate your humility. It's very attractive. I find as I've gotten older, and I'm 76 now, my need for authenticity has grown. And I, because of that, I think some of my friends have changed. I've sort of forgotten about some and nurtured others because some are more authentic than others. They value it or they think about it or they, they somehow do it for me and they invite it from me. So um, I, I don't know what to, I don't, that's not a question, it's just a comment, I guess. Did you find that in your research? Yeah, um, well, I can say two things about that. Um, I have found it in my, my own life. So we'll put the research aside for a moment. Um, I find that, you know, with each passing year, my circle of friends grows a little bit smaller, not um, through any sort of big dramatic falling out or anything like that, but just a, a kind of, so actually sociologists of religion talk about the sort of growing number of people leaving religious traditions. Um, and they, they largely put these people in two categories, people who break away from a religious tradition. So something, you know, more sort of uh, um, because of a negative experience and it's, it's kind of a hard break. Um, but then they also talk about the people who kind of drift away, who just sort of move away from the institution gradually over time. And I, I find that in some of my relationships um, that, you know, perhaps we um, 
offered something to one another at one point in our lives, but as you know, as time has gone on and our needs have changed and what we're looking for has changed, we've kind of drifted apart and there's no hard feelings and we'll still talk every now and then. And so I find um, with each year that my social circle grows a little bit smaller, but also that those relationships grow richer. And I think part of it is that I have more capacity um, with a smaller circle of friends to go a little bit deeper in those relationships and that 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 is something that I value. Um, it's not something that everyone needs to value, but for me, that feels important. And so if that is part of what helps me feel close and connected to people, then, you know, given that many of my relationships either exist online um, almost entirely or sort of have to right now because of the, the current moment that we find ourselves in, how can I get that same feeling from those online connections. Um, and that's, that's, I think, part of what I was reflecting on while I was working on this project. Um, and I do, I do, we did find in, in some of our research, and there's, there's actually a lot of research on this, I think, um, that there are certain things um, that people desire out of, uh, you know, and of course, everyone desires slightly different things, but that, that um, a feeling of, a feeling that someone can be truly themselves, um, uh, you know that they don't have to think too much about what they are sharing or not or not sharing and whether or not that's okay or not um is a a, a a significant indicator of whether or not that relationship feels fulfilling um and and brings them meaning and I, you know this is something i've experienced in my relationship with my mother um as you know as, especially since i moved back um and and we work you know worked together to help take care of my stepdad um what has helped me feel closer to her and grow closer to her is um, gaining more and more of a sense that, you know, I can just be myself in that relationship um, and that I don't have to overthink. When I was younger, I, I, I worried a lot about whether or not something was appropriate to share with her or not. Um, and now, you know, we don't have as much of that in our relationship. Um, and that has definitely helped us feel closer. So um, I guess I would just echo um, your sentiment and, and say also, yeah, that there is some social science to back that up, but um, everyone's needs are different and not everyone feels that same need. Can I add a bit? At the same time, yeah. I think I'm more deeply disappointed when other people don't live up to the values they espouse and that's, it feels judgmental, but it's hard to help, hard for me to help feeling that way. Yeah. I feel that way too, um, but I also, one thing that helps me with that specifically, and this may not be um, super relevant to the book, um, but it is, uh, it's a good question. Um, I, one thing that helps me with that, especially if I don't always like the judgmental feelings, I think it's, you know, I think that's data to pay attention to how you feel about, um, you know, things that arise in you. One thing that's been helpful for me um, is looking at my own life and recognizing the many ways that I continue to fall short of my own values all the time. <laughs> Um, and, and if that doesn't excuse, um, other people when that happens, but it does help me understand, um, that that is, that's not an uncommon occurrence. Um, what makes a difference for me is whether or not someone is able to recognize that and whether or not they're sort of actively working to address it. Um, because, you know, I've, I've had experiences with people who sort of thought, um, or, or who acted that um, sort of acknowledging the inconsistency alone was was kind of an action in and of itself, and it is. But but that that's really just step one. Um, it, there needs to be some sort of follow through, um, and I, I do think um, life online. This 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 is sort of related to the book. I I often feel like my social media output functions like a kind of um, mindfulness exercise almost because uh, years ago I started doing this kind of mindfulness practice at the recommendation of a friend where at the end of the day I would reflect on four things what was the most challenging thing I experienced that day and what was the most fulfilling and rewarding thing I experienced that day and then what was the um, what's the thing that I'm sort of most nervous or anxious about for tomorrow and what's the thing I'm most excited about for tomorrow and then I would try and you know allow myself to think about those things and then kind of try and let it go and 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 go to sleep. Um, but one benefit of that activity was that it helped me start to notice patterns in my life, the things that were most consistently making me feel fulfilled, um, and the things that were most consistently feeling you know stressful or difficult, and that you know maybe I needed a little bit more support around. Um, and similarly, you know, 
regularly sort of posting online helps me start to notice patterns in myself, in what I share, in what are the things that maybe more regularly feel newsworthy to me. Um, and that, that again, is data that can help me better understand myself and work on myself and continue to try and grow as a person. Now, do, does everyone need to have a Twitter account? No. Um, journaling is another way to do that. Um, but I do think that having, you know, regular practices that can help you notice things in yourself and, and try to address those the inconsistencies, as you mentioned, that we all have, um, I think have real value. Thank you. So, thank you. Yeah, thank uh, you. So that'll wrap up our formal program. And I want to, again, extend a, a big thank you to Chris for his wonderful